we need to make sure that people understand that traditional knowledge and in particular navigation and canoe building, these are sacred knowledge. Our indigenous ways and knowledge has always been with this understanding that whatever is passed on to us, whether it be navigation or canoe building, it's meant to be passed on to those that come after you. It was never really about them or us now, or it's always about those that are coming later on. This has always been the way that we have lived on these islands. It's never new to us. It had always been core to how islanders live. That philosophy of having to think about those that will come later on creates all, all the respect and dignities of everything that we do. So our ways of learning and our ways of practicing and our ways of dealing with these resources on that level allows for us to, to always think about tomorrow's generation rather than ourselves. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Kate and to uh, Milani for putting together that short video as a way of introducing. Uh, please allow me first to pay respect to this land that we're sitting and standing on and to those greatest seafarers who came before us from the island of Guan and the Marianas. May I ask my panelists to please come and join me? Suro, Suro Rang, my respect to the heavens. Suro Tarup, my respect to the land of Guan. Suro Tat, my respect to the seas. Suro Tamur, Robut, Mar, Sari, my respect to the chiefs, to the leaders to women, men, and children. So, thank you, MC, for introducing me and my panelists here. To all the distinguished speakers and distinguished dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, 
It could not have been by chance that our people came to these shores thousands of years ago without having to navigate their way here with a star at the bow of their canoe and an island at the stern. That island was their Fatumul, their origin fixed at a position that made it possible for them to chart their course toward the Marianas. We could not also claim that our being here as people of this island several thousand years later is by some chance. We are here because our ancestors made it core value to their actions and behavior that they do not jeopardize the meager resources of which their lives and more importantly, that of their future generation depends. In other words, if they had not thought of us, perhaps these islands and our lives indeed might have been different. Their ways were not only ecologically justifiable and sustainable, it was designed in perfect harmony with the environment in which they lived. Their fundamental values were based on a code of honor with an order of hierarchy that places at the very top their surrounding environment, the heavens, the ocean, the land, before the chiefs, the leaders, the community, the clan, the family, and at the bottom of that totem, self. I come from an island that is 1.5 square mile in size and has a population of 300 people. Growing up on my island of Lamatrek, and as expected of young boys, I learned to love the ocean at a very young age. I learned that the beautiful ocean that sustains us can also be very mean and has the ability to devour us anytime it wishes to. When I'm in it, I know that the ocean absolutely has no regards of how I feel. Therefore, it was essential in my early learning that in loving the ocean, I was also taught to have that tremendous respect for it and to always be ready for what it has to offer. Today it has become apparent that this loving ocean is also threatening our survival as it rises due to climate change. The irony is that we know full well we have contributed little to nothing to the cause of sea level rises. Yet we are at the forefront to lose our homes to unexpected and devastating typhoons, to, lo to lose our reefs to increasing ocean temperatures, and to lose our land to sea level rise. More than 30 years ago, I set out on my own voyage in search of that world beyond my horizon that was responsible of sending to my shores all those useful yet curious product, a side of flip-flop uh, flip -flop that would be paired with a discarded shoe or a plastic container or an empty bottle of Coke, perhaps maybe a portion of a per se net, fish net, cut off from the main net stuck to the reefs. While we could transform these into reusable items in those days. Today, they have become nuisance 
and just some piles of rubbish. This journey has taken me places I would have never thought existed. It has made me see new things that had me question their logic and applied physics of their very existence. So when I escorted my auntie three nights, three days ago, through the Guam terminal, and she refused to walk on the escalator, I walked with her on the stairs, knowing how she must have felt. I did the same 30 years ago. Being lost in the city of San Francisco on arrival opened my eyes to many things that not only fascinated me, but most of all, scared me. I realized then that contrary to my early learning, this new world has, as it were, self at the top of the hierarchy. Me this, me that, me first. I realized that in this new world, my fish would be caught in a chill box or a can from shelves of supermarkets. My taro harvested in the same manner after being flown from some faraway lands. This new system essentially cut off the connectivity of my hands and my legs to the ocean of which the fish swim and to the land where my, my mother gardens her taro. While it allows for my convenience and perhaps personal luxury, it took away from my being. Having said that, let me be clear. I welcome the advancement of technology and material. They have contributed in significant ways to our human race. I also believe that with our culture and traditions, reaping, boast, reaping best of both worlds is a rare opportunity and choice that we in these islands can truly say we still have. My voyage has made a 360 degrees turnaround and now I found myself working for a nonprofit that I helped start it, teaching indigenous knowledge and skills to the younger generation. For after all, it is never about me, it is always about them. I am great, very grateful for the vision and support from the University of Guam, Dr. Shelton, President Kreis, President Underwood, you made a big impact on me having to do this. To the TASA organization and others through the course of time, time, and of course the students who have decided to unfold and roll out the mat of learning passed on by my ancestors. I have decided that in this keynote, I will have them join me to share their own personal observations. But before I recognize them, may I ask the audience to please join me in a chant to uplift our panelists. This is a chant that is used for lifting heavy weights, pulling our canoe. And basically, I ask the audience to just repeat the last word of the chant. So as a demonstration, if I go, Weikumo, Weikumo, I res you respond with that last word. So here we go. Please stand. Weikumo, Weikumo. Wake them all, come on, Lee. 
Kamale Mau Mau Rimithiwa Rimithiwa Kawiwia Kawiwia Lituate Thank you all very, very much. At this time, I recognize Rudy, and this will be go the presentation will be going in the sequence of being the older down to the youngest. As always, I'll, I'll make this quick. Uh, culture or Pacific culture of the islands are intrinsically tied to survival. Uh, life is one of hard work, surviving in an island is isolated, harsh, and unforgiving. Ancient strategies for continuity is seen in the carving of proas, botanical medicine, collective cooperation, and non-instrument navigation. We experience these strat uh, strategies as lessons from our master navigator, Larry Rangital, while understanding that the consequences of our decisions are bonded to the spirits, as how our ancestors understood their environment. We learned the rising morning stars herald each new calendar month, and these fighting stars are tied to the weather. We identify the steering stars of the star compass and wave currents and how they are used in voyaging and wayfinding. As Pacific Islanders, we have a sense of self standing in our own truth and identity. The transmission of knowledge, though is a problem because we do not have written history. We do not have written history, but what we do have is memory. Ancient strategies are stored organically in living tissue uh, of the mind and are passed down face to face from parent to child, sometimes disguised as metaphors as stories of constellations or songs like Malak na Putiyontasi, which some people say is a navigational song disguised as a church hymn. In oral history, everyone who teaches you touches you. Now, strategies are sustained, uh, of sustained life are preserved in ancient memories to deal with recurrent ecological threats. One of these strategies is the strategy of abandonment, the strategy of abandonment. My people have used it in ancient times with navigation to escape environmental collapse like a volcano or, or a war. We abandon a reef or an island which is no longer sustainable so that it can recover itself with intentions to always uh, coming back. There was a time in 1793 when, because of diseases, the number of natives in the Marianas as a whole totaled about 1,766 natives. Uh, our people at that time, it didn't really look good uh, for them. But I am suggesting that it was important that our oral history and stories are encoded with information like wayfinding instructions so that we can rebuild knowledge like navigation which was outlawed by death. I am here to demonstrate that our pre-contact legends and stories are directly encoded with wayfinding instructions uh, like remote fishing banks or other islands reflecting some collective ancestral intelligence. The core of these contact pre-contact stories are lessons of sustainability and wayfinding passed down accurately. It has to be accurate or else you'll be lost out at sea if navigation is entangled into it. Now, the first oral, le um, the first oral legend is about a boy named Taga, who, after uprooting a coconut tree to retrieve his pet crab away from his father, it's a famous story. Uh, the boy Taga eventually became chief of the islands north of Guam. After Running from his father, he started at a beach called Aperguan, or Duncas Beach in Aganya. And he jumped to the island of Rota from the cliffs of Hinapsan. If we draw a linear line of the boy's trajectory, the path leads to the Rota fishing banks, exactly, and uh, to 
to the north and all the islands of the Southern Marianas called Laguas, which includes Rota, Agrihan, Tinian, and Saipan. And that's just uh, one legend. The line also locates the Galvez fishing banks to the south of Guam. Larry, our master na navigator, has um, taught us that the rising constellation of the Big Dipper is used by tradition to point to the direction of the northern islands of Guam. And should the Chamorros ever abandon Guam, this is the, dire the direction that they would take. Now the second legend, you can have that, thank you. The second legend, which is painted as ancient pictographs in the caves of Talafofo, and in Arahan is, is the story of a chief of Tumon village named Malaguanya, who sailed to the village of Inarahan seeking a battle with his chief named Gadao. The conflict really, um, they, didn't, they did not fight, but the conflict evolved into a contest of strength with the venue shifting from the island of Guam into the ocean. The two chiefs boarded a single proa canoe and headed out to the ocean. The two chiefs paddled the canoe in opposite directions, eventually fracturing the canoe into two pieces and launching themselves in opposite vectors like a line. Now, if we connect Tumon village with Inarahan village, we create the first line. When we translate that line, because they moved the battle out into the ocean and consequently moved that line out also to the ocean, we intercept two shallow areas, something like fishing banks to the east of Guam, connecting them. And that's how we know when we should st stop uh, the line from going further east. Um, as the two shallow areas are connected east of Guam, it leads to Rota to the north and touches Rota at its easternmost side. The legend ends in two ways. It has two endings, which really is not a conflict. One, we have Chief, Gado, uh, Chief Gado's half of the canoe gouging a river at Inarahan, and the second ending of the legend is uh, Chief Gado, uh, half of his canoe, landing off the village of Mariso, creating a small island called Asgadao Island. Now, if you connect these two points, you will locate Galvez fishing banks to the south of Guam. These fishing banks are sites for sustainability. Now, all our pre-contact legends are encoded this way. It's just that we look at the veneer, the surface of these stories. To understand the heavens, the navigators have told me that the steering stars are sentient. The stars are alive. The stars have consciousness. The stars have agency to affect the navigator. And in my conversations with the stars, even for a brief moment in time, I became my ancestor. Thank you. When we first, on our, on our very first class, Larry started off by letting us know that um, on a drive by a military construction site, he saw logs of um, breadfruit that had been cast to the side and abandoned. And he decided to stop and pick up the logs and use them to build the canoe in our class. Um, when he brought that up, we talked about the public access plan. We talked about the construction of the live fire training range. We talked about issues of healers and local carvers getting access to the things that were being destroyed in the over 1,000 acres of pristine limestone forests that were being taken down. This is how we started our class, talking about the ways that we were extremely vulnerable, the things that we were vulnerable to, and things that we were trying to salvage, literally salvage from the destruction, as well as salvage lost knowledge, knowledge that has been uh, taken away from us because of colonization and militarization. Um, we later, he later shared a story about um, when he came for FESPAC before they left for the voyage to Guam. Um, there was a meeting of elders, and the elders had were worried about uh, the risk of bringing rhino, rhino beetle from Guam back home to the islands in, in Yap. 
And so they were instructed to sink the canoes as soon as they got home. And so after a long voyage back from Guam to Yap, um, they sank the canoes in the lagoon and swam in. A boat came out to get their gear, but they had to swim in. Um, so this made us think about invasive species and how Guam sort of serves as a, a lesson for things we've already had to lose for the rest of Micronesia. We get to show what happens when you lose all these, these things, when you start to lose all these things. And then an, one other day we were in the jungle and uh, we were trying to get uh, some wood for the canoe house. And there, someone had cut down some, some ironwood trees and had left them there, some young ironwood trees and had left them there. And Larry said, um, well, someone already cut these and they, and they left them, so we better put them to use, even though they were harder to work with. So in every lesson, in every activity, um, we, talk, you know, we talked about how we have to use everything, um, how nothing goes to waste, and, uh, and, and how a lot of these environmental challenges and cultural challenges we're already facing, um, those challenges will be exacerbated by climate change, these things that are already vulnerable. So um, we, we really focus on using locally sourced materials, natural materials. We didn't use one nail in any of the construction that took place during the class. Um, but we talked about what was making it harder to get access to the coconut fronds, to the trees. And so there's always this clear connection between cultural and environmental sustainability. And what Larry was, was really trying to emulate and, and to teach us was a, a complex, um, sit, bro very broad, holistic system of knowledge, um, which really there is no distinction. Um, these two things are one, cultural and environmental sustainability. And it's a way of life. It's a life way that um, unless you're there every day living the life of the seafaring community, you're really gonna miss a lot. And so we just barely scratched the surface in our class of um, all the, the things that uh, this life way encompasses, including, and, and so Larry has uh, stepped out of this, uh, the way that traditional and sacred knowledge is normally shared. And we are outside his inner circle and he has chosen to, to, to share his knowledge with us and together we built a space where the knowledge can be shared and exchanged with community. Um, he also emphasized memory. We can't take our notebooks out in the canoe. Um, so indigenous epist epistemologies, lifeways, engineering, physics, meteorology, hydrodynamics, metaphysics, understanding of the elements, all these things are part of this very elaborate system, this, this way of life that also includes medicine. What kinds of medicines you need to take on the voyage, the kinds of food, um, that you need to take, chant, language. So there are all these ways we can look at dealing with issues of injustice for colonized islanders, just in the way, uh, in this life way. And also how we can protect it from further exploitation in the future. Um, Larry came to Guam uh, in the first class, he didn't have, he had his crew. In the first seafaring class, he had his crew. But this time he didn't have his crew. And so we were able to work with a lot of his family members. He called a lot of his relatives, cousins, nephews. This is actually his sister, Josefa, who is weaving um, a piece for the, for the ridge gap for the canoe house extension, which my friend is gonna talk about. Um, but uh, what this really emphasizes is this collaboration with the local Yapis community, also connections that we've lost because of colonization. So we're not, we're not just salvaging um, knowledge, we're salvaging relationships, we're re we're, and we're revitalizing this, uh, a lost life way, and um, reclaiming the things that have been taken away be for, because of colonization. And so, these are his nieces, and then uh, another, another nephew of his helping with us. So I'd just like to take a moment to name some of the people, uh, his family who came, Simon, Bradley, Josefa, Fressi, Alice, Archie, Billy, Ben, James, and another Vicente. Um, it was really a great opportunity um, to not only meet people who call Guam home, who share this knowledge, we, we learn from them, we learn from each other in our class. Um, it, we, we built a lot of new friendships and relationships and, and this is key in our survivorship as a people. Um, collaboration was also really key with the TASA crew and we really need to thank uh, Sandra, Fermina, Guelu, David and his wife and his daughter Kia, also Vicente um, and Victoria and the many other members of TASA who um, also we learned from and spent a lot of time with us during the class. Um, what this really emphasized for us was um, is, is that in order for 
for revitalization to continue and for this knowledge to continue, collaboration is key. Um, this is a great, you know, we're looking at a collaboration between TASA and the University of Guam. The University of Guam is reaching outside of its scope for cultural continuity and also looking at the sustainability of the revitalization movement, the seafaring movement itself, because we're, we're building the community that's gonna keep that going. And so um, community, community building, nation building is a big part of the, was a big part of the experience. Um, we also shared in food and shared in stories. Um, Larry likes to say we have to open the mouths uh, so that uh, the knowledge can be exchanged. And, um, and uh, you know, one, one of the biggest takeaways is that our best hope for independence is to look at the ways of how we take, take care of each other, how we take care of each other in the region. And so um, your canoe is, it, it was really mind blowing. Your canoe is at the center of the universe. You are the center of the compass. And so you, you're looking at this dome of stars and it's literally and figuratively uh, a way a way to see yourself in the world, a way to see yourself in the ocean, a way to see yourself in the universe that uh, is, is really a big part of, of reclaiming what, is, what has been lost and what is threatened for our community. So thank you. Hopefully. Guana Tempu Natihu Hasu Puri Historian Estina Archipelago. Natihu Hasu Puri Historian Guahan. Natihu Hasu Puri Historian Itau Tauhu. Imania Moru. Hongenu Hasu Puri Zotku Historia. Then Historian Ifamilioku. Lo Anawet. Tasina Uli Nadinanya Idos. I Historian Guahans and Historioku. In a Soku na I Problema Sia Gihalum Ifamilioku. A Taza Matogui. Then end now we see the city, the historian Guahan. Look off Lati to put end now, then go off Tristi to put end now, then go off Lalalu to put end now. In these navigation classes, for the longest time, something so simple eluded me, pertaining to gathering my bearings when charting a course. Something so simple, yet one of the most important aspects of figuring out where you are at in the ocean, and that is your point of departure simply knowing where you're coming from. In life, for over 30 years, the education system set me in the direction of faraway ideas of progress, development, and economics. I've been sailing practically my whole life without really understanding where I come from. And it went the same for many of us here. In navigation, you can set a course for a Chamoa Island to the north. You can use the North Star to set your direction. You can use the rising sun to the east, and you can sail north. But if you drift east and then correct your direction to that north star, you can still miss your island. You can do the same to the west. You can once again set your course for Chamorro Island to the north, use the north star and the setting sun on your west, drift west, correct your direction to the north star and still miss your island. But if you would only remember that your most important bearing is where you come from. You can parallel yourself to your path and you can regain that path and make it back to Pagan. People in these times will talk about the reality of the world we live in and the need for ideas of progress, development and economics. But remember that our reality is that we've strayed from the path of sustainability that we had then. People will talk about globalization and the need to keep up with the rest of the world but flip the script, what is happening today is not simply a tomorrow renaissance or a Micronesian renaissance or an oceanic renaissance, but a renaissance of the world. And it starts with us. We are not on the outskirts of the rest of the world playing catch up. We, we are at the center of it, playing the guiding star. Everybody on the outside that has come here, Magellan in 1521, San Matoris in 1668, America in 1898, or even us here today came here in need of something, in need of food or in need of some sort of fulfillment. Today we come in need of an answer. And in that sense, the outside is depending on us and our islands. And today they depend on our knowledge, on your knowledge here today at this conference on island sustainability for an answer to how to be sustainable again. Hafa Gwaha Zengen Hutungu Na Edzuet 
Hun er sitter be tungu pada be in sustenihem gi estina tempu gi estina tano. Guahana biai nama tuli itining o mami zema pega gi otu bandan i na sotte. There were times when they took our knowledge and placed it on the other side of our minds. Then guahana biai nama nyuli ham edzu na hina sotte zen pega gi mon ni tauta. Sometimes we retake that knowledge and place it back in front of us. Was luck we it out taught on a motna, elect mommies and elect near her, Neman Lazakam, Kulen Mangupu, Ipaluma Sia. They said we sailed how the birds flew. Was luck we angin who lee na gumupu si paluma, who has to na kulen malika angin who tatiji, Ipaluma Sia, Pari Itano. A bird may take you home if you follow it, but where is bird? Lo Manu Gaigi si paluma. and thank you. Um, so I'll try to get through this uh, fairly quickly, but uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the bulk of the work that we did during the course of the class, which was centered around one aspect of the traditional navigation, the canoe house. Uh, so just to go a little bit into that process and the resources that we used, um, you know, we learned kind of as what Monica was talking about, we learned that traditional navigation is a system, a network interconnected and interconnected with and consisting of the canoe, which includes the carving of the canoe, the mastering of how to sail it, navigation, which includes identifying the rising and setting constellations, understanding the weather, the swells, and the currents, and also the chants, which convey like the directions uh, out to the open ocean. They, they convey like directions out in the open ocean. So when I started this class, I was really excited to inquire with Larry about um, uh, what they call the Metawal, the journey from the Carolines to the Marianas, um, you know, which I'd heard about, and, and it talks about um, uh, the big fish. So in, on this journey, it talks about these, these things that you see on your way. One of them is the big fish, or the ikalap, ik ikalap um, which I believe are the pilot wells, uh, the same pilot wells that um, with the military uh, sonar, uh, the, the, the same uh, pilot wells that are, effect, that are affected by the military sonar. But um, so the pilot wells and also um, this, uh, this um, smell that emerges when you reach uh, Saipan. So, you know, when I started the class, I asked about it and you know, Larry said, yep, it's true. <laughs> um, also included is this, in this is a traditional healing, um, knowing how to take care of a member and your crew should someone become injured. And, uh, and also food, sustenance. So each of these things are just kind of one part of the whole. Um, and so the canoe house being another one of those things. It's the place where information is uh, transmitted and uh, where knowledge is transmitted. And it was very meaningful and fitting that we as a class began with um, essentially building our own classroom. So. Um, <laughs> um, we built an extension to the Paseo Hagatnya Canoe House. It is the first of its kind, and we started by collecting um, ideal wood to build the structure, prepping the wood, erecting the main posts called the sur, and uh, securing the long side beams um, called the tarilap, and um, the short, the short uh, beams, the shorter beams called the hoichum, uh, hoichum, and the woi. With the woi are the skinnier beams that run vertically from the apex. Uh, down to the tarilap on the side, and they serve as the uh, frame for the thatch. Uh, we also learned about the sohol yolofat. There's another beam that's, so these are not all the beams, these are just a few of them, but another one of the beams that we talked about was the, the um, so, um, sohol yolofat. And uh, it's like the last structural be uh, beam named after the trickster deity in, um, in uh, Yapi's tradition. And according to story, when everyone was building the canoe house, yolofat, um, slept in to avoid the work. And when he found out that the house was all done, then he finally arrives with these two beams. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And everybody was like, uh, what do you, you know, it's done already, useless, you know? And, uh, and um, it actually ended up serving a really useful purpose as a crutch and providing the counterbalance for the house. So we learned that story from, from Larry. Um, so this kind of shows a glimpse, of, I think it shows a glimpse of the, of the Yolo fat, but also the thatch. Um, so, going into the resources as well, um, we used the, uh, the gagu, the ironwood, uh, the pagu trees for the various posts and beams, and we collected and wove the coconut fronds. Uh, reused, we also reused nipa from, the, from Fespak, and so this last one kind of shows us alternating between the nipa and then the coconut fronds. 
Um, again, as um, as Monica had mentioned, you know, we started the course. Um, so prior to the course, Larry had gone out and, and uh, salvaged a lemai tree from some of the bulldozing by the military um, on the back roads. So, so that was what made the canoe. Uh, so here's the canoe. This is the latest uh, picture of the canoe, picture provided by um, Sandra from Tassa. And uh, so the continue, even though the, even though the course was ended, the, the canoe continued to be built, and and students were we were all welcome to come back, even though the course was done, and and we met also to um, do some stargazing and learn more about the constellations. Um, we also see here, so here's the so again the canoe, and then we can also see uh, Guelu there and some of the other members. Um, after the course, many of us, like I said, still met, and um, there's that. We put that lattice there on the, in the canoe, just kind of a little touch. Um, and um, our learning from Larry and about the tradition, you know, it's not finished yet, as a, you know, even, the course is, even though the course is done. We have a long way to go before we're sailing to Luta. Um, and even though this course is complete, we'll, you know, we'll always be Larry's students, and moreover, with an important responsibility now to carry on this knowledge. So. Um, in addition to realizing more about the meaningful um, part traditional knowledge uh, like this plays in sustainability and working with and making from the environment and about how indigenous knowledge um, is just really ingenious. Um, we also realize that this is learning and mastery that surpasses the format of the class and, and um, which, which Tori will now uh, will talk about in her section on lifelong learning. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited. So, um, Mogatin, half a day. Hello, Mogatin for Larry, all of Yap, half a day for us. Um, his tomorrow students, hello to all of you, um, really to connect all of us. And um, this is, this is, uh, so yes, this is to connect us. <laughs> um, Megai, this is a tomorrow word that means many, and I know. Um, our, my, my elders, our elders were also saying Dunkalu Nasizus Maasi, but I also want to um, add on to that and say Megai Nasizus Maasi, many thanks, because there's many people here, many backgrounds, many cultures, you're from different islands, different, um, different places, and you all came here for a reason, for a purpose. So Megai Nasizus Maasi to all of you. And I'm gonna reiterate um, some of the thanks you already said, because again, we have to thank them many times because they've touched us in so many ways. Um, so UOG, CIS, uh, there's Dr. Austin Chowton, Ms. Fran, and um, Tatiana used to work with um, CIS, I believe, and she touched, oh, pardon me, uh, I actually went to high school with her. And of course, Larry really touched us and um, with his oral knowledge, passing his uh, sacred knowledge down. And to the left, that's Dr. Atori. I just want to acknowledge her, one of our professors, she really encouraged um, some of her students to take this class and take this opportunity, and she really um, looked out for our, our interests and you know kind of fed it so we can grow in that um, direction that we're looking for, uh, as well as many of our other professors. So thank you all of UOG, and also again, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Tassa, and Tassa's over here in the house. Thank you again. Um, if it wasn't for TASA and UOG, CIS, C Grant uh, working together, we wouldn't have Larry and we wouldn't be here today. So thank you again. Um, Larry, our teacher, our master, master navigator, it was a real honor, real pleasure, and something we'll always take home to be part of this class and learn what he was able to reach out to us. And uh, this is going to go twice, I think. Yep, it, or no. So our class, not all of our classes here, Vanessa is here, so thank you for being present. And of course, um, some of us, some of our classmates weren't, were unable to join us today, so we wanna reach out to them and recognize them. And, oh, that went fast, sorry. That went really fast. So what did we do? What did we learn as students? And this is Vanessa here. Um, we learned how to use the resources around us. Um, we mentioned that, so not that I want to take away from that importance, but you know, to I know some of us are hungry, we have places to go, but we learned a lot. We learned to really use the resources around us, make use of trees. 
Sometimes we think of trees, um, trees that have fruit are useful. We use trees that did not have fruit, but um, while we couldn't consume them you know, in our mouths, we can consume them for our life, our lifestyle, and we use this to build an extension of its first kind, which really um, symbolizes this connection, this new, you know, this new generation, this hybrid, right? Um, and it's, it's awesome. It, we, we learned so much. We're still going to meet up with Larry, meet up at the canoe house, and we learn how to build together. This is literally Larry on the bottom, on the very top is Hide. We did not use nails. We learned how to lash, and they're learning how to lash together, like literally, and to put this house together. So we're trusting each other. We're trusting ourselves. Um, how to connect. This is Andrew. He was one of our little Spider-Men, or he was, he was our Spider-Man, and he was scared of heights. But um, how to connect. And look at even the way we um, use the, the NEPA from Festpack. We use the the coconut fronds that we have left from the rhino beetle devastation and even though it's not all uniform it makes a connection and it gives us shelter it provides us a place to learn to study to grow how to help one another i could not find a front face picture of tim he's down here and this we stayed late at night obviously it's um it's dark here but um whenever somebody started doing some type of work, whatever it was, to contribute to our house, to contribute to the canoe. Somebody, it would just, you know, trigger this chain of chain effect, and everyone would just get up, help one another, contribute. So that was a awesome experience. And here, lifelong learning, we have Elizabeth and Carl, and as you can see, she was expecting at this time. So lifelong learning for life, of course, it's explanatory in and of itself. But it's not just going to be us. It's going to be, it's going to be um, the next generations. So uh, another thing was understanding, understanding this past culture that is in us, living in us. We're still here today. We're not gone. We can touch back with our roots. And Larry really brought us back in time while moving forward. Um, Lifeway, way of life. That's Larry. This is at Seti Bay. It's blurry, but it's clear that Larry went out. We're in the, we're basically in the sticks, right, on, on Guam. He went out with his family, Bradley, and they went and they, they, they fished. They, they went, they, they didn't have scuba diving. They, they fished with their own spear. And um, they fed us, and they taught us that, hey, this, we can still do this. Um, we're capable of this. This is what we were born to do, what we're made to do. And they, they brought enough just for us to, to sustain ourselves for the night because we, we were camping and we were stargazing. Oh, traditional. Uh, so I put traditional in a, in a circle. And this is an actual photo from our stargazing. Ancient traditional ways. Um, so ancient traditional ways, like we mentioned earlier, this sacred knowledge, there's a, a, a realm. And this had to be passed down to you. You couldn't just go and say, hey, I'm going to be a master navigator, mom and dad. Teach me how to do this. No, they, the, the elders chose you. So that's what makes this, this class really, um, really awesome. And it's an honor. And so this is the past, right? Uh, sustainable then. We're learning about how our ancestors, ancestors were sustainable then. And then now sustainable again. Share the knowledge. Share the love. Yes, we understand that in history, you had to be chosen, and it was an honor, and it was sacred. But now we have to face the reality of our climate change, what our world is adapting to, adapting to what we have to adapt to. And so I like this simple picture. I just use it on Google. It's colorful. It, it, it shows, it doesn't, you know, it's, it just shows people and the earth, and this is our home. It's all of our home. It's not just one person, me, myself, and I, right? And why, why care, why share, why adapt, why adjust, why history, why connect, why preserve, why collaborate, why take action, why make change, why, why, why? These questions that we ask ourselves can also be our answers. And there's more than this. You can see it's one question and it leads down to bigger things. And our world is big. And with us, we're islanders, we're small, but we, we have a big impact on the world. And this knowledge we learn, we can take it and we can really change our world. I'm serious. We can change our world and I believe it. So I'm almost done. I took this off of also, thank you everybody. Mega Inesi Zuas Masi. This, I took this off. This is a Guam coastal cleanup. We constantly 
you have Guam Coastal Cleanup once a month or you know how many times a year? It should be an everyday thing. Clean up after yourselves. Who wants to bring someone to a messy house? Do you bring your guests and let them sleep on sleep on the floor? I mean, sometimes we like sleeping on the floor for our back, you know. But um, that's another thing. These are reasons. This is from UOG Go Green Army Philip Cruz. Uh, oh, he was sitting over here. Go Green Army in the house. Um, this is they're just cleaning right outside our campus entrance. This is between um, UOG and GW High School. And they're they're taking taking pride like this we have and it's it's this is an awesome picture because it shows the college students here setting an example for our high schoolers who will then you know go to college and whatnot. Um, the coral reefs, uh, Larry mentioned it. We have to do this because how are we gonna have fish? If we want convenience with fish in a can, we have to take care of our coral reefs. We have to be mindful of our environment and our surroundings. Our grass fires this year, so many grass fires. That's another thing, climate change. It's, you know, it's getting hotter, more buildings, more concrete. And this was on Dr. Austin Shelton. Again, I Googled this. This was on your PowerPoint and the erosion. <laughs> The drone is amazing. I heard this from them in a, another class I took and was able to connect with them. And yes, I'm so sorry. So yes, erosion. You want trees. Yes, we want trees. And ancient future, ultimately ancient future. It's kind of like a, I forget the English term. If any English majors are in here, we can meet later. But ancient and future, you're bringing the past and the present together to now because to now, right? That's a hashtag that. But um. <laughs> Ancient future, you should hashtag ancient future. So we need to bring the past and the present because we always say, some, some of us think that, I'm a history major, some of us think that history is useless. We, you know, it's, it's in the past, leave it in the past. But no, we really need to get in touch with our roots. We need to dig deep to what sustained us on our land, what, where we're planted. And so I'm a tree, these are my roots, I'm gonna spread out. Whether I give you fruit to eat, I'll give you my arm to build a house. I'll give you my leaves to build a roof. I will give you shade. I will protect you. I will give you shelter. And so this, I, I cried in our rehearsal. Ancient future. Um, Nick, can I borrow your green? So let me just go really quickly. This is my son. I think of him. I'm a first time mom. I am not a pro and I have little patience. <laughs> But I think of him, ancient future. I took him out early in the morning to watch the sunrise and he fell asleep. I was like, but anyways, um, he stays up all night. But um, um, so I think of, I chose this picture because when he wakes up, what if I'm not there? What did I leave for him? I want to leave, I was joking with our classes that I want to leave a green footprint in everyone's heart. I want them to feel this impact. And you know, I really wanted to dig deep, just like our roots in, in the ground. This is Paluma. You saw earlier that Elizabeth and Carl, um, they were pregnant, they had a baby. Paluma means burn and it's so beautiful. And so she, she's the future navigator. This is Larry's grandson. He's so adorable and he makes me want to have another baby, but not yet. <laughs> and this is Larry, this is, you know, this is Larry's future. And Larry mentioned in his gesture, look at him, he's saying, me, grandpa me, don't forget me. You still have to do this and, you know, share this knowledge with me, pass it down. Then we have Uncle Rudy's two kids here. Look at them. They're gonna be, they're gonna be the elders of our kids here. Even Georgie, this is Vanessa's son and Serena. I barely brought my son, but every time I saw Serena and Georgie, I was like, man, I should bring my son. Then I brought my son. You know, we had a, a conflict schedule, so they weren't there. But um, these these two were here and they participated and they were helpful, so helpful, and it's just it's so simple. This knowledge that is sacred is so simple. The kids love it and we can, we can change. We start from the bottom and we will work our way up and we will, we'll, we'll change our world for real. And <laughs> this is uh, Maria Sol. This is uh, Nicole's daughter. And even her, you know, she, um, she's gonna have a pop-up by the way. She's uh, making her own uh, jewelry and earrings. And even that, you know, she's using resources at her hand and this, this all connects. And then we also have Austin the fourth. And um, this was nice because even um, Dr. Shelton came down and he, he's, he could be our, our next uh, CIS uh, in charge, right? He'll, he could follow in his dad's footsteps. And who knows, maybe these will all be the future collaboration, right? But really, it's like we've all been saying, um, Senator, Senator Barnes, Dr. Kreis, everyone, Dr. Austin Shelton, this is for our future. And you know, you don't have to be a parent to, to, to say, oh, I need to do this for the future of my kids. You can have nieces, nephews, it affects all of us. And 
this is our ancient future, whether we have kids of our own or it's just our family. And that's what makes this so meaningful. And this class will really blow your mind and change your life like forever because it will change, it, it's changed mine. And so I don't want to press it one more time and it skips. This is our last slide. So we wanted to end with, um, let's continue, let's start charting and continue charting our future through the past. So sustainable then, sustainable again, this couldn't be a better, better theme and more fitting for us. And thank you very much, Megan Asizus Mossy. I hope you guys enjoy your break and day and have a awesome week. It's all about Tori. It's all about those kids. Please join me to uplift the future generation once again in closing. Waikamo, waikamo. Waikamo, waikamo. Waikamo, kamale. Kamale mao. Mao e rimithua. Mithua kawiwia. Kawiwia litute. Sidious Masse, thank you very much for the time offered. <laughs>